scripture reading is from Jeremiah 29, verse, sorry, Jeremiah 29, colon 1, and 4 through 14. These are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders among the exiles, and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people who Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. It said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let the prophets and the diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed, I will visit you and fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with home. Then when you call upon me and come to pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me, says the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. This is the word of the light. Thanks be to God. How's my volume? Good. Folks, will you pray with me? Holy God, we thank you that the sermon is not the most important part of doing church. That the church belongs to the people and occurs in what happened just before the sermon is preached in the prayers of the people. God, we thank you because you hear our voices and you listen to the cries of our hearts. And that even when we are in exile, you call us back with your promises that you have a hope and a future for us, even if it's one that we cannot see. It's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen. To take a slightly different tone shift, I started out with a game of hide and seek, so that didn't flow perfectly, but you know. So last week, I was playing hide and seek with a couple of kids that I babysat. And playing hide and seek as an adult now is quite entertaining because you can hear how frantic the kids get when they're trying to hide. And as I'm counting down from 10, I can hear their footsteps shuffling along until they figure that their trusted hiding spot, crouching behind the couch, cannot possibly ever fail them. And as I get closer, I can hear them trying to hold back their giggles because they can't help it. They're just trying to not burst into laughter and get caught. But when the roles are reversed and the kids are the ones counting while I hide, I notice that the point of the game changes a little bit because now the whole point of hide and seek was that the kids would find me. That's why the game works. I'm an adult. I can hide and not be found if I wanted to. I think, <laughs> but the parents in the room or the nannies in the room can testify that when your kids are calling out to you, you don't hide from them. When they're seeking you, you let them find you. You don't stay hidden. And even if it may not be obvious to them, you're the ones who are letting the kids find you. Now, God's job requires a little more responsibility than that of a babysitter. God is not at our every beck and call. And that's the great thing about being a babysitter. You get to give the kids back. 
You may discipline the kids a little bit, but really it's their parents' job to discipline fully, to form them into who they're supposed to be, to give them a hope in a future. So similarly, in our story today, God expects more of Israel. The Israelites have been exiled into Babylon because they were living like they didn't need God. So they practiced idolatry and they were disobedient. They were hiding and they did not want to be found. So God exiles them. But they are not exiled without something to hold on to, namely a promise. God repeatedly promises at the end of our text to Israel that when they call out to him like a good parent, God will let Israel find him. Except this isn't the end of the story. It's not just as simple as that, as stories of exile often aren't. God places a requirement on Israel before they can be restored. Israel was given a great promise, but right now, in exile, everything has gone wrong. You see, Israel was invaded by the Babylonian Empire, and they were taken captive, and their survival as a community was in serious doubt. The community was reeling from all the consequences of this disaster, and violence had imprinted itself on the minds of the people, leaving victims without words to communicate what was happening to them. And unless you are a refugee, many of us can't really grasp what it's like to be forced to leave your home, fleeing from danger, forced away from the place you grew up from, never to return. But perhaps what you do know is what it's like to not feel at home. Perhaps you can relate to some of the feelings that Israel was feeling in your own version of exile. Perhaps this exile has come from your family. Not approving of the decisions that you've made or who you are. Perhaps this exile has come from divorce where the person you entrusted your life to decided that they know everything there is to know about you and that they were done. Or perhaps this exile has come from your very own inner dialogue, choosing to isolate and ignore problems instead of addressing the situation. We all know what it's like to not feel at home somewhere. And that pain is the result of exile. And the thing about pain that we do so well as a church to address even is that you cannot avoid dealing with what hurts you. It festers in you in unexpected moments and it rears its head out when you least expect it. Israel had to deal with their painful situation and God's command for how Israel should do that might be a little bit surprising. God told them that they were supposed to get comfortable in exile, make it cozy because they were gonna be there for a while. They were told to integrate into Babylon, not assimilate, but integrate, build houses and plant gardens and marry and multiply. They were supposed to somehow make this place that they were exiled into their very home. And perhaps, the most striking of all is that they were told to pray. And not just any old prayer. They were told to pray to seek the welfare of the city that they had been exiled to, to pray on its behalf, because it's in its welfare that they would find their welfare. Have you ever prayed on behalf of the thing that has exiled you? Let's be clear, this doesn't mean that you need to forgive the thing that has exiled you. This doesn't mean you have to submit to the thing that has, has exiled you. The biblical witness means what it says, to pray on its behalf. What would it be like for us to take this into our very own hearts and pray for those who have exiled us? You see, God commands this of Israel because God needs Israel to listen again 
This is the first time in Israel's history that they've been told to integrate. They were always told to be set apart, but now they're told to make a home because their practices had led them to destruction. So God needed them to start fresh. And when God delivers this painful decree that they should pray for the thing that has exiled them, he couples this command with a promise that God will hear his people when they cry out. But you don't get one without the other. The promise comes alongside the obedience because not all practices are nourishing for a Christian life. Rage and anger should run, their co- should run their course. They are fine to run their course. But what's the long game? You can't stay there forever. You can't let exile become who you are. God has a promise for you. And he wants to set you free. So what do we do when we feel this sort of abandonment? How are we supposed to make meaning in exile? How do we hold all of this pain? Knowing that it is not our jobs right now to make purpose of this pain. Because that is something that happens in the rear view mirror after a lot of time has passed. And right now we are still in the middle of it. But we do know that at some point we have to move. Jesus wants us to engage with our exile and move through it. So when we cry out, God gives us this dream that completely reverses the reality of the captivity that the Israelites are in. God tells us in our distress and in our crying out and in our expressions of anger and rage that he has a plan, plans for a future. God hears us like the parent who hears their child trying to find them in hide and seek. And God says, I will let you find me. Our only job is to seek him out, to seek God out in the loneliness, through the tears, and in our deepest pain. Because God has this grand promise to restore us and to bring us home. And without God, we would be lost because this cycle of exile would happen over and over again. But God doesn't let that happen. Instead, God shows us this great story about God's relationship to creation. And this story culminates for us as Christians at the cross. Because exile happens to be this crucial point of our salvation. Jesus was exiled from his people. His own beloved disciples left him. He was exiled as an enemy of the state. And Jesus being both fully a human being and fully God was exiled and abandoned by God. But Jesus is where it was all going anyway. And this prophet prophecy of covenant is what is going to be our eternal reality. That we can be consoled by Jesus's deliverance on the cross because Jesus put to death God abandonment for us. Jesus exhausted death's ability to threaten us. Jesus takes us out of exile into an eternal promise. Now, sometimes these words are more comforting to hear than other times. Sometimes we are so desperate and hurting and we want Jesus so bad that we're like, God, you are all I could ever want. I have nothing else left to give. And sometimes this promise that Jesus offers us just feels out of reach. And I want to encourage you today that that is completely normal because we are in the now and the not yet. So in the meantime, we come dying to God to find out that we are going to live. We surrender our ways in exile and follow the ways that God has set out for us. And we seek the welfare of the things that have exiled us by praying. And we hope that in all this mess, in all this anger and hurt and pain, that our hearts would be transformed.
It's in Jesus' name. Amen.